this, I'm going to be talking today about what makes life worth celebrating. And I'm also going to be touching a little bit on uh, a subject brought up earlier, which is uh, how we can preserve uh, interesting cultures. But also, I'm going to be doing something which I know is very rude. Uh, not rude where I, I come from, not rude where I've been living, which is in uh, the USA, but it's rude here, which I'm actually going to be talking about myself. <coughs> I apologize. So I'm going to be telling a story. Um, and the story, uh, as you just heard from Kevin, involves uh, something that happened in uh, Sumatra. Um, and it does actually, I'm going to use the story as a way of thinking about uh, life and about giving uh, meaning to the lives of other people, uh, particularly people who are far less wealthy than anybody in this room. At the time of this story, it was um, seven, about seven years ago, I was working as an industry analyst um, in mainly technologies, telecommunications and the like. I'd been pretty successful. I'd managed to persuade uh, lots of companies to do various things, including to understand that poor people, no matter where they are, typically aren't stupid. They're just poor. And so if they actually get a piece of technology, they know better how to use that technology to improve their lives than we do. They have the, the insights in how to use that. And I, for example, persuaded, I think, Intel uh, to open operations in Nigeria and Siemens uh, to, to expand its African um, operations because it was obvious that as the cost of technologies went down, um, companies, individuals in, in the developing world could really expand what they were doing. So at the time of this story, uh, that's what I was doing. However, frankly, I'd actually spent relatively little time um, in the poorest parts of the world, even though at that time, there were many stories emerging of people struggling and eventually buying a mobile phone and being able to use it to transform their own lives. We, this, this kind of picture, I love these pictures, because just a few years ago, uh, they were impossible to have you know, an, an Indian monk, a, a Tibetan monk, um, and a little girl in, I think that's in Mali, in uh, northwestern Africa, with mobile phones. It was, it was completely strange. But now, everywhere in the world, people know that if they can get a mobile phone, they can transform uh, their own lives. Sumatra. Let's start thinking about Sumatra uh, from the perspective of here, where we are here um, at TEDx in, in Taipei. And first of all, uh, hello to the people from um, TEDx Singapore, which, which is shown. Um, Sumatra is an island. Its area is about 15 times larger than that of uh, Taiwan. Um, but it has only twice the population of Taiwan, so it's not quite as, as, as crowded. Um, it has an enormous range of mountains. The sort of yellow line that goes down it is where the earth is almost tearing itself apart. Um, and yet none of those mountains is actually as high as uh, Yushan in, uh, in, in Taiwan. But it does have over 100 active volcanoes. Um, the points you can see up there are a reference to Toba. Uh, Toba, when it erupted about 75,000 years ago, created an ice age. The crater, the caldera that remains from it, is 100 kilometers across. Think about one eruption on a 100-kilometer crater. Uh, most recently, and just a few, few months after we were in Sumatra, um, there was a terrible earthquake, magnitude 9.3. I mean, it just the, the, the strongest earthquake any of you have ever been in is about 100 times smaller than that. Um, that earthquake killed about, the, the tsunami that followed killed about a half million people. And the bottom uh, is one of the most famous uh, volcanoes in, in uh, world history, uh, Krakatoa, Krakatau. Uh, when it had its major eruption in 1883, it created the loudest sound known. It was heard 3,000 miles away in Africa. Um, 
it blew the island completely apart. And, uh, but in the last 20 years, it's been growing at eight meters a year. Eight meters a year. Uh, actually, we, uh, the, the guy who runs the pizza shop behind us uh, took it was at Krakatoa in November when it erupted again. Um, so this, this is a dangerous place in, in some ways. But where we were uh, was um, Mananjau, a, a beautiful place, um, which we'll talk about. It's actually um, in the, the Menang Highlands. Uh, the Menang Kabao people, like most people in Indonesia, are all Muslim. But this is not what you think of as Islam. It's a matriarchal society, so that the villages and the families you know, it's not a big man, it's the head woman. And it's matrilineal. Property and the family name goes from mother to daughter. I actually don't know what the guys do. <laughs> um, they also have extremely good uh, cuisine. Um, it's a little spicy for some people's tastes. Um, an extremely unusual um, architecture um, with roofs uh, in the shape of buffalo horns. In fact, Minang Kabao uh, actually means victorious buffalo. Here's a house. Um, and the, uh, the spikes there are supposed to remind you of buffalo. And this is, this is not a palace. This is just a house. Uh, and this is a village elder. Um, and you can see this is the, the older woman in a village, uh, the village of Pariangan. Um, and the uh, then president of Indonesia in 1948 uh, wrote a little poem. I, I think it's actually a bad poem, but he did say, do not come to the Minang Highlands um, if you don't go to Maninjau. So this is Maninjau. Um, this is a crater. Um, so it's a, a volcanic uh, crater. The lake inside it is about uh, 13 kilometers long, 10 kilometers across. And, and you notice it looks kind of shallow. It doesn't look like it's know, deep, there's no boiling um, lava, so it seems like a nice place to go for a walk, a uh, hike. Um, and of course, uh, I have you know, high-tech uh, hiking boots and um, great gear and all that good stuff, so it looks like a good place to go. Um, what was not possible in 2004, there were no published maps of the area. So it was actually a little difficult to get around. This is the, 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 the lake there is, is uh, Danao Maninjau, the, the lake. Um, to the east of it, you can see a little town called Bukitinggi. That's the capital of the Menang people. And you can, if you look around, you can actually see four other volcanoes um, on that map. The biggest is Maninjau. Um, Marapi was uh, erupting slightly uh, when we were there. But Bukitinggi is a reasonable side city, and frankly, uh, we were staying in a nice western hotel. And the, the hotel manager, who spoke French, uh, said that, you know, really know to go to Maninjau, nice walk, have the taxi take you there. You walk down this clearly marked path and um, taxi will pick you up at the bottom, nice day to way to spend the day. And so we got in the taxi, uh, which he'd arranged, and uh, took us off toward, um, by the way, can you anybody see the road around Maninjau? No. Good. Uh, and it took us to the wrong place. Um, of course, uh, we didn't know it was the wrong place because there weren't any maps. Um, so we got out, and all we have to do is walk down. And so how difficult could this be? <laughs> well, two things you can actually see in this picture. Uh, the first is, that's a path. Um, after we, you know, we started out on a path, and after a while we were like, wow, this doesn't feel quite right. But now we're sort of stuck in the jungle. Um, and the second thing you can see is it doesn't actually seem to be going very far that way. And then there's this steep stuff on the other side. Um, but you could actually hear you know, the occasional motor scooter or, uh, down by the village. And, and so it's like, keep going. Oops. Um, so the first cliff uh, we came to um, it wasn't that bad. Uh, maybe a, a small jump of uh, eight to ten feet, and then the next one was you know, the height of this wall and scramble down it. And the next one was about twice that size, and uh, somebody rather stupid um, fell rather badly, uh, burst this hand open, broke the bones, 
gashed here, various other bits and pieces. Um, and uh, it's, it's an Islamic society, and so um, my wife ca was carrying a silk scarf, so that became the tourniquet. Um, and uh, then we kept on going. And the next cliff was even larger. Um, at which point, since I could only use one hand and lost a lot of blood, she headed off alone into trackless jungle as the day comes to an end. And he's right on the equator, so you know, at six o'clock, you know, it's lights out, everybody will go home. So um, uh, she headed off to try and get rescue. Um, Yes. <laughs> now, <coughs> this is a, a monitor lizard. Now, people in, um, are probably familiar with the Komodo dragon. Uh, this is not one. Uh, this is two standard size uh, monitor lizards, just sort of uh, two meters across. Um, and yes, if they bite you, uh, you will die. <laughs> um, so that those were her um, companions as she made her way down. Um, also poisonous spiders and stuff. But you know, so, so uh, meanwhile, back on the mountainside, uh, she, we had a very little bit of food. We were told it's an easy walk, you know, and then, then you know. So she had a, we had a little bit of food and water, and so she took that. And in my backpack, I had a book, a camera, a pair of binoculars, a bottle of insect repellent, cleansing wipes, and a mobile phone with no signal, which I used as follows. <laughs> the book I was going to eat if I got really hungry. The camera was clearly valuable because um, if something showed up uh, which was um, maybe a little hungrier than me, I would use the flash. Um, the pair of binoculars was the heaviest and hardest thing, and so it would be the thing I could throw. The bug spray, I, had, uh, was to, I sprayed on the trees um, so that you know, if, if something hungry came by, they say, there's something down there, but it smells really bad. <laughs> um, and the mobile phone, um, I set the alarm because I decided, whatever happens, I am not going to fall asleep. Um, and about 7 o'clock in the evening, um, a bunch of monkeys came in uh, and settled in the tree above me. Um, and I was actually really pleased because I knew that they were actually going to, one of them was always going to stay awake. And it was one started to drop off, it was oh, your turn. Uh, this is actually um, a picture I took during the night because there, there were noises. There were lots of animals. Um, lots of animals. Um, and, and Mary Lou, you know, she did get down to the village. Um, she actually tried, without success, uh, to commandeer the uh, loudspeakers in the um, uh, mosque uh, in the village. Um, and uh, she spent that night and, and the next morning um, arranging rescue teams. Um, you know, hands up how many of you think your wives or husbands would do this, by the way. <laughs> uh, and here's what one of the things I was concerned about was um, one of the things I decided I was not going to read the book. Because in the book, it actually told you how many tigers were still in Sumatra. <laughs> and I'm actually not good at some things, like falling off cliffs, but I am good at math, and I could calculate that there had to be at least one tiger within five miles. And, and that didn't sound very good. Um, so 16 hours later, uh, so going all the way through the night, um, and... Uh, uh, started climbing, um, uh, but after a few hours, I could hear that there were people um, in the um, in the jungle, in the fo in the forest. And uh, so remember, I'm high tech gear. And eventually, these kids um, and their dogs found me. And of course, they're wearing um, you know, sort of 20 cent flip flops and uh, carrying machetes. That was critical. And the first things they said to me when they um, <laughs> which is the single most stupid question I've ever been asked in my life. <laughs> um, so um, after that, uh, I was taken, uh, actually had to walk most of it all the way off the mountain, um, and they took us down to the village of Bayer, 
and uh, from there um, into uh, what passed for a clinic. Um, and then the clinic looked like, if you imagine a doctor's office, um, where the doctor left uh, in 2003, left the door open, and nothing has happened since. Um, and, um, uh, well, they had to patch me up. Um, and they found the Novocaine considerably later. <laughs> and, and, of course, the next thing that you have to do um, is to thank everybody. Uh, we took everybody out for, for a nice lunch. This is the best restaurant um, in, in Mananjau. And, by the way, it was, it, was, it was great food, having not eaten for now uh, a day and a half. Um, and uh, there's me and there's uh, Mary Lou wearing a, a shirt that says uh, real relaxing man in jail. <laughs> and, and, and we were very glad actually. Um, we had to pay all the rescuers. Um, I think the, the going rate, and this is a, a very poor area, even though we have fantastic culture, the average uh, wage at the time uh, was around one dollar per day. Um, and so paying the, the sort of the, the, the rescue team and all their cost uh, was not very much. And so we gave away basically everything we had. And one guy said, I want your phone. Because if I have a phone, I can start a business. This whole area, as beautiful as it is, is mainly subsistence farming. And there is no way to claw your way out of subsistence farming. In, into um, a world where you can communicate with others um, and participate fully um, in society. And so this graph, this graph was uh, popularized by a professor at Harvard University, Clay Christensen. And what it says is that although we are used to the idea that innovations occur in technology in the sort of the BMW, Apple part of the, uh, any ecosystem at the top, and then if you're lucky, they sort of trickle down. Uh, what actually can happen is a little different. I think we're all used to the idea that over time, the complexity and the feature sets of products increase to the point where um, you don't need them anymore. Um, for example, anybody who's used Microsoft Office products? Anybody here? Oh, come on. Um, there is no feature in Microsoft Word uh, that's been added since about 1996 that anybody actually knows how to use. Um, and so it just gets more and more complicated. And in th what that does is um, creates the opportunity for um, products to come in at the bottom of the market and completely take over. And what this tells us is that the other way that we should be, and we should always be thinking about introducing technologies, whether it be mobile phones, or medical care, or computers, as uh, John Waddlington um, and, and Mary Lou have done. If you've come in at what we think of as the bottom of the market, um, it is the place where uh, you can, in pretty short order, take over the marketplace. And at that point, that's the second connection from the Sumatra story to right where we are here, which is the capital of so much of, uh, of technology thinking, that we can really enable people's lives to become much richer and much fuller. But the best way to do that is not to come in it, um, come at it from the BMW strategy, uh, but to think about uh, what people can uh, use and to give them uh, products that they can use. And the second thing, the second and final thought that I would add to this, is that today for, um, we have as mobile phones, basically very small computers. And the mobile phones that are very f small computers, the smartphones, are also going to places where, in like Bayeux, uh, in the Menang Highlands. But in this case, if you have a smartphone, you almost certain today, you almost certainly a few years ago had a computer. Whereas if you take a smartphone into parts of Indonesia, Western China, most of Africa, you're handing a, an incredibly powerful, interesting computational device to somebody who has no prior experience of a computer. When you do that, interesting things will happen. 
they will use them in surprising and innovative ways um, that nobody had thought of, just as um, uh, John Wadlington can tell you uh, has happened repeatedly with the OLPC project. You give a powerful machine, a powerful tool to somebody who doesn't really know how to use it, and in this case, they'll do fantastic things. And so, I, I know I've run a little over my time, and I apologize, but I wanted to go through uh, the story of Sumatra and what it tells, um, at least me, what it can, stories like this can tell us not only about a life worth living, but also the power and the limitations of technology and how we can use these uh, to, meet the, uh, to create the opportunities and meet the challenges of those in the still poor parts of the developing world. Thank you for your time.